And he says to me, you learned, everything you learned is because you were teaching Hashem's children and Mida Kineged Mida, he let you learn. And everything you learned was not because you were smart or because you're capable or because you were in the right circumstance. It's because you taught Hashem's children, he made sure you learn. And he says, if you stop teaching Hashem's children, you will not have that schus of Mida Kineged Mida. That really, he really scared me. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of Inspiration for the Nation. I have been trying to get rid of Cutler for a long time, and I am so excited that I finally got him in his home in Lakewood, Ir HaKodesh, to talk to him about BMG, his experiences in the Catskills, and his his unique relationship with Rosh Hashivas, and how he did it all, and what is he up to now, and his view on on Yiddishkeit. He is a very amazing micro but also macro look at how things work. This episode is Le'ilu Nishmas, in memory of Shimon David ben Yaakov Shleima, as well as Miram Sarah Bas Yaakov Moshe. And you'll hear throughout the episodes, I have a few gems for you. Uh, where to buy your esrig, uh, which, which books your children should be reading, and maybe you, as well as another fantastic book. So you'll hear more about it in this week's episode. We can all use some inspiration to help us overcome the obstacles we encounter in our lives. Get ready for thrilling conversations about struggle and triumph with those in pursuit of making a positive impact in this world. I'm Yaakov Langer, and you're listening to Inspiration for the Nation. Okay, so here I am in the home of Rabbi Aaron Cutler. At what point in your childhood did you realize that your, I guess, family that you're from is like, I guess, a little different than the rest of the other families? It's a really good question. I don't really know. Uh, I think we always grew up in a very unique world. We grew up in a yeshiva world that was very small <clears throat> in those days. So um, we knew we were different from the greater culture around us, even the greater Jewish culture. But part of that was related to the fact that Lakewood was so small and everyone knew each other in our community. And there was a tremendous sense of familiarity and warmth in the community that I was growing up in. <clears throat> so my parents were not distant figures in any way from people. The home was not like some sacred home of separate from the world. Um, we had the little... Jewish community, and it was very integrated and central in that community. And you kind of grew up with that norm of open home, religious people, non-religious people coming in, yeshiva guys. Uh, it was common to see yeshiva guys coming in and just taking ice cream from the freezer or finding food in the fridge. Very Heimish. Yeah, it was very, very... Uh, it's very casual. I don't. I don't think our door was ever locked, and that extended out to the yeshiva, which <clears throat> was all of a block away from the home and in the neighborhood. And our neighborhood wasn't all from, but we certainly knew we knew everyone in the neighborhood. And uh, I knew that that world was somewhat different than the great big world at large, the cities of the world, and all. And I used to go to summer camp, or as a kid, we would go to Brooklyn, and I felt a very distinct difference. Here, you knew everyone, and it, it was just very, very familiar. It sounds like a more of out-of-town type of community. Well, it certainly was out-of-town. I had two Shemr Shabbos classmates. Wow. And okay. uh, then one moved to California, so then I had one Shemr Shabbos classmate. Uh, so it was very small. My siblings went out of town the Rashiva of Malkiel and my brother Mayor Zahar Lavracha went out of town when they were six and seven years old. My brother Shragi and Issa Zalman, my, my brothers went out of town. They were maybe eight or nine. I didn't leave Lakewood for education for Chirach until I was 11 years old. So I kind of felt lucky that yeah. I, made, I made it that long. But I would say if there's a memory, it's not really of this, uh, like, we're a distinctive family. It was a memory that we're a very distinctive community. Mm. And what was distinctive about it really is the warmth and familiarity. And Rav Schneer was 
I think every bacher in yeshiva, every kolol yungaman in yeshiva felt that my father, Rav Schneer, was their best friend and that he loved them and cared about them and tremendous sense of closeness and warmth. And for my mother, really the same. My mother was the, uh, uh, if I could think of the shaduchim she made and the choylem she took care of, she was Bika Chaylam and Tom Shabbos and the Shatchen and um, the psychologist and the Rebetzin and the person who raised money and the, the home to cry on or the refuge um, for everyone around her and for the community. I mean, that's what she was. So there were probably hundreds of people who called her Yiddish for aunt as Tanta, Tanta Rishal. She wasn't really called Rebetzin in those days. She was There were probably hundreds of people who called her Tanta Rishal, but they were not my cousins. <laughs> Many of them actually sort of lived in the house through the years. So uh, that was pretty pretty unique um, as a kid growing up. I hear that. And and I don't want to jump ahead because I want to talk a little more about your background, but I'm just so curious. Did you ever anticipate that Lakewood would boom into what it is now when you're in a class with two, one Shomer Shabbos classmates? Well, I don't think that kids really have a, a sense of uh, – data and trajectories <laughs> and the ability to anticipate the future. Uh, we certainly felt like a very distinct minority in the world. Uh, there was no money in those days. We kind of knew that. Um, there were big, beautiful temples going up in Lakewood by reform denomination, conservative denomination. There were others. They appeared wealthy. Uh, in those days, if you, had, if you were wealthy, you drove a Cadillac or a Lincoln Continental. Lexus hadn't been invented yet. Hmm. I know I'm dating myself, but <laughs> so the people would, you know, you'd see wealth in other other parts of the world, maybe other parts of the community. Uh, we didn't have that, um, so we knew we were different. Uh, we knew that this was a very uh, special yeshiva community, but really didn't have any other sense of uh, certainly no sense of trajectories or paths of the world, with the, how the world would end up. So at what point in your life did you go to Israel and go to Eishat Torah? Uh, I first went to Eretz Yisrael when I was a bacher. I went to learn by Yitzchak Salvechik. And uh, then came back, did what many do, came to Lakewood, uh, learned in BMG and got married. And then about a month or six weeks after we get married, I moved back to Eretz Yisrael. And um, I have a very dear friend. Hold on. was the You dated when you were in Lakewood? Yeah. Was the freezer around then? Uh, I don't think there was a freezer. There was no freezer. It was no. before the freezer was invented. Yeah. It, was a, it was the ice box. Yeah. I don't even. know why people get so caught up on the freezer. I guess <laughs> I guess it's kind of like a distinctive thing, so they think about it. I think to the outside of the yeshivish world, they're like, so like, what? I don't get it. Like they, right. that's, I mean, it's, that's it's not even a blip on a blip on a blip of, of but okay. I was <laughs> just staying on track. Yeah, yeah. So I came here, I dated, I got married, and then- we moved to Eretz Yisrael, and I had a very close friend uh, who was a one of the main rabbeim at Aish. Mm. And I went back to learn by Yitzchak Soloveitchik. I was there for a while, and he used to, my friend would bother me to come teach at Aish. I would laugh him off, because like most yeshiva guys, you don't really know that much. I mean, you might know... <laughs> You might know a little bit how to learn, right? But in terms of actual knowledge base, uh, outside of pure Gemara and and how to operate halacha like a religious Jew, you don't really know that much. And uh, you know, teaching secular Jewish kids and adults was uh, you know, requires you get all types of questions, and oftentimes you don't really know the answers right. to yes. those. Yeah. So. Uh, and you don't want to fumble it. So I would laugh him off. But uh, ultimately, he prevailed, which I have no regrets about. So he encouraged me to come to Aish, and I started teaching at Aish Atira, And uh, was very blessed to have a Kesher, not strong enough uh, when I look back, but a Kesher with Reb Nayach and uh, had my years there. Wow. Okay, so I have so many questions here. First of all, was it like, at all taboo for the Cutler family that you're going to be a Rebbe or teach in Asia Torah? Or it was like, no, this is just, I guess, we don't really teach philosophy as much. We're more like Gemara. And 
Well, I don't think my family really knew exactly what I was teaching. Oh, you were just like in Eretz Yisrael. Yeah, anything. I was in Eretz Yisrael. <clears throat> uh, I know my mother took tremendous... Uh, a pro- my father wasn't alive. My mother took tremendous uh, healthy pride hmm. and, and joy in the fact that I was teaching. Uh, so I, she appreciated that. But also, you know, my own family, uh, my grandfather... Built yeshivas around the world. He was uh, in Kirov before Kirov was allegedly invented. Um, him and Zev Wolfson built yeshivas around the world. They built. He built Chinuch uh, with Mr. Wolfson in Eretz Yisrael. Uh, Rivaron was involved in building yeshivas in Argentina and France. In many countries, he wanted to build yeshivas in Egypt. He built. He, he had a plan to build yeshivas in Eretz Yisrael, and. Um, if he's alive today, he'd do in Dubai, probably. Yeah, wherever, <laughs> wherever there are yidden. Right. And um, his focus was building schools for young kids, building uh, yeshivas for older kids, and uh, Tyra, Chinuch, Tyra Chinuch. Um, so it really wasn't that out of the box for uh, that notion. And my father was a a mini Rosh Hashiva in a sense, at a very young age as a Bachar in Eretz Yisrael. He opened the yeshiva with my uh, with my cousin, uh, Hirsch Meltzer, as his almond son. <clears throat> they had a yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael. And then my father opened the yeshiva. He and my father then encouraged and pushed the building of many yeshivas here, especially for secular Jews, Baragayla notably, but others. He pushed Lake Virginia Light to go into Kirov, um, Shalom Torah Center was probably one of the first real cure of schools um, that was really very strongly cured, that wasn't anchored by a Jewish community. Torah Messiah in those days would build Jewish communities. I'm sorry, would build yeshivas day school, yeshiva day schools in Jewish communities. Mm. But Shalom Torah Centers was built without a community behind it, just as a as a Jewish school. So I it really wasn't that unusual. It's it's interesting that you had such a, you know, I mean, had, I don't know, such a close one, but you had definitely had a relationship with Reb Noach. And what, I guess, differences did you see in the approach of Kirov, I guess, between your grandfather and Reb Noach? I'm not a big believer in parsing minor differences. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I Chazal say that just as two people... Parts of fame are different. Their faces look different. Their ideas are different. I'm not really big on parsing differences. Uh, I prefer to try to think of um, how they thought alike. And I think my grandfather had this notion that Tyra is the heritage of every Jew given to them at Sinai. And... If they don't have it, somebody stole it from them. So I think there was a small sense of, maybe not so small, of indignation. If you read Rav Hirsch, you often see the sense of in- indignation in Rav Hirsch at the false prophets. If you read the Rambam, he talks about the uh, the, the false priests of the world. And Rav Noyach had that sense of indignation that this is an outrage and the Jews who don't benefit don't have the benefit of a uh, entire education. Someone somewhere along the way misled the people and took it away from them. It's unnatural and it's upsetting. It's frustrating and you should do something about it. And Ravarin was ready to do something about it. His whole life was doing something about it. Rav Noach was ready to do something about it and many, many, many others. And we need a lot more people like that. Okay, I like that. So, so after that, I don't know how after you went to Kolel in the Catskills. So you were in Israel, but then you transitioned to upstate New York, which is one of my favorite places in yeah. the world, upstate New York. What what led you there? Uh, so first of all, you must have done some investigative work. Oh, I, mean, I know your social security at this point. Yeah, okay. Uh, what is it again? I don't want to tell everyone yeah. else, but I'll tell you off here. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so teaching was a very intense experience. Um, you, first, you have to know your stuff. 
but you also have to really connect to the people. And it gets very intense, very taxing. And um, it's also really humbling. And after teaching for about a year, the feeling that I had when I started teaching was that I really didn't know anything. So I used to go into Reb Nayach and say, I've got to quit this. I, I, can't, I can't teach. I don't know anything. And he would, uh, he'd get really mad at me. And he didn't want to accept it. But then year after year, the longer I taught, and then I had all these students and kind of looking up to me and I'm their Rebbe and all that. And I really, after a couple of years of this, I really had the sense I just didn't know anything. <laughs> and I said, okay, so I better do something about it. So I went into Reb Nayach, uh for one of the final times and I said to him, Rosh Hashiva, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to quit. And uh, I'm gonna, I want to go learn in Kyle. And Reb Noyach, he's this massive personality, brilliantly massive, insightful uh, in every way, incisive wit, and uh, again, a lot, of, a lot of frustration in him about what the Jewish people look like. So uh, he said to me, do you think you're smart? And I said to him, but with, you couldn't lie to him. Right. So, you know, most people think they're smart. It's, it's an anomaly because you know, only 50% could be smarter than the, than the 50 percentile. But, mm. uh, and then 50% would be, well, 49 and 49, whatever. But uh, So I said, yeah, I think I'm smart. He said, in the f years you were here at Aish, did you learn a lot? And I, again, you had to be honest with him. Mm. I said, yeah, I really learned a lot. And I had, I learned a ton. So then he says to me, and I knew he was, because Ramnach would set you up with these simple <laughs> questions. I sort of knew where he was going. I didn't know exactly where he was going. So he says to me, do you think you learned a lot because you're smart? Question one and two together. So uh, you, know, you try to be humble. And everyone wants to, at least you play the humility right, game. Right. Or you want to be humble. So you say, well, not really, you know. Uh, Hashem was good to me. You, know, you give the, <laughs> the from platitude answer. And we love platitudes. And uh, he, gets, he gets mad at me and he said, what are you talking about? Hashem works on Mida Keneged Mida. The way you act is the way Hashem and heaven acts with you. Don't you know that? I said, yeah, I know that because you do know that. And he says to me, you learned, everything you learned is because you were teaching Hashem's children and Mida Kineged Mida, he let you learn. And everything you learned was not because you were smart or because you're capable or because you were in the right circumstance. It's because you taught Hashem's children, he made sure you learn. And he says, if you stop teaching Hashem's children, you will not have that schus of Mida Kineged Mida. That really, he really scared me. <laughs> um, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I really uh, didn't know anything. So I decided- Well, I'll just to clarify, just to get, I guess, a little deeper into well, what did you want to learn? What well, there, I mean, Torah is like the yam, you know? I mean, you go to yeshivas. I started teaching when I was 23. Uh, I, Cholin, Shabbos, Nida, Ervin. You do learn a little bit of Pesach and Bekiyas, and you learn a little Brachas Bekiyas, but I mean, come on, Torah is like the ocean. and. Uh, so you know Bava Kama, Bava Masu, you learn Ksubas, you learn Kedusha. I mean, yeah, you know, if you even in those Masechtas, you don't really know them well. And certainly when you're 23 years old, and I started teaching when I was 23, 24. Um, so uh, I just felt there's all the things, I just don't know them. And I, I couldn't shake that. So I decided I'm going to go learn and... Uh, after what? wait, so after he told you, you you I was still yeah. He 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 really hit me hard, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I just I just don't really know anything. Mm -hmm. So I thought I'm gonna I'm gonna quit teaching, and um, I'm gonna go learn in Kyle. And I don't want to go back to Rebbeitzuk Salvechik. I, I I was blessed with a incredible Kesher with Rebitzchak, uh, most remarkable cashier. Um, 
but I didn't want to go back there. It wasn't the environment that I was seeking in terms of, of learning. And um, I wanted to cover certain mesechtas. And I started looking around for Kailalim, and I really would have gone anywhere. It didn't make a difference what the location was. And then I heard that South Fallsburg, where I had learned as a bacher, hmm. was opening a kail. And I heard of some of the, the the names of some of the guys who were going, and the, the Rosh Kailer of David Breslauer, one of the uh, biggest Talmud on the planet, and a tzaddik and all. And I, I thought about it. I said, that's the right environment and the right place. So uh, we were living in Eretz Yisrael. We had two kids born in Eretz Yisrael. My wife was, uh, I think she was expecting at the time, but we sold all our worldly possessions, almost all. Kept kept some sperm and some other stuff, and sold our car, gave up our lease, and uh, moved to the states, and moved to South Fallsburg, and uh, started learning yeshiva. And how long did you stay in South Fallsburg for? Uh, I guess we were there about four and a half, five years. At that point, did you set up your life that you're gonna end up there, or that for you was kind of a uh, tentative timing in your life? Uh, you know, I, I, I used to joke with my the Rashiva, my brother, I would tell him that. I, I told him this when I was like hitting the four or five year mark in BMG because I was at age for about that time and then I was in Kyla for about that time. So when I, when I was in BMG at about that mark, I said, I think I'm getting that four or five year itch. <laughs> he said, don't, don't scratch it, leave it alone. Um, but uh, we were in, we were there for four or five years, uh, probably about five years, and um, incredible, incredible year. My chavrusas were the best. The kail was the best. The social atmosphere was bar none the best, and uh, really a beautiful life there. Really. So, what got you, I guess, to go back to BMG? What was that point? Well, I wasn't really in BMG before, so it wasn't really technically back. Okay, so but I won't hold you. Well, you got back. What got you back to Lakewood? Yeah. So, um, when we were living in South Fallsburg, there were various secular Jews who would kind of wander in one way or another, and invariably, I would end up learning with them. <laughs> and in our last year there, there were. Enough of them, and with some friends, we started a cure of organization in the Catskills. So I was still learning, but I was also had this little cure of organization. And um, I didn't have any real organizational experience, but it was a, a great a great uh, couple of Rav and uh, Rebetzin and Monticello, Rabbi uh, and Rebetzin Leibowitz. They, they were at the... Uh, Sullivan County Hebrew Day School in Kaimisha, Rabbi Irving Goodman, um, uh, Rabbi Eisner and Ellendol. The Catskills really had incredible rub on them, really incredible. Yeah, my, my Rebbe's mother grew up the uh, G- G- Gib- Gibner oh. Gibber. Yeah, Gibber. Oh, sure. Yeah, I knew yeah. The Gibbers. Yeah, I I knew I knew the old the, the Maurice and Rose Gibber. Yeah, a very special Catskill family. Yeah. So the really incredible rub on them. I mean, Rabbi Eisner. Rabbi Herman Eisner, as a Chayel of Racha, um, was a legend as a Rav, widely respected, expert in Kirif, but in a very small town. Total Masiris Nefesh for uh, for Yiddishkeit, him and his Rebbe. It's in Manya, I think, was his name. But uh, he was there in Ellenville. Rabbi Leibowitz and his Rebbe in Shoshana were in Monticello. Total devotion. Um, it was Rabbi Kreitman in South Fallsburg, but then he was Nifter. Um, they were um, just the most incredibly devoted people. So we we did a lot of Kirov together uh, with the Rabbanim, Rabbi Irving Goodman, a mamish, a legend of, of a man. Which is great because um, Rav Noach basically, like, I guess, drilled into you, Mida Kanegad Mida. So now you're getting to learn yeah. and, you know. Yeah, it was good. It was Fill your thing yeah. and then also get, okay, listen, I'm helping Hashem's children. Yeah, it was good. It was good. Uh, and... The the people of the Catskills, uh, most visitors, summer visitors, didn't really understand this, but there were about 10,000 secular Jews in the Catskills at that time. And most of the locals in the communities were 
of Russian Jewish descent who still identified as Orthodox, even though they were not religious. Mm. So they had a tremendous reservoir of sympathy for, for Yiddishkeit. Um, and um, even the um, conservative rabbi was sympathetic. The reform rabbi who uh, lived in Monticello let us do cure of with his people. Hmm. Like he, he was happy we were doing it. Uh, so uh, it really a, a very special opportunity in a place. The community as a community was sort of dying because the young kids didn't want to stay there. Uh, but it was still, when I say dying, I mean it was, it was weakening. It wasn't as strong. But the police officer in South Fallsbury, Stewie Wismer, was Jewish, and the, the UPS guy was Jewish, and... Uh, you know, people would come to your house all the time. The electrician, the plumber, uh, they were all they were all Jews, and um, they felt really connected. The guy from the gas company was Jewish. The the shoe store, I think the shoe store was not Jewish. Uh, Smith's uh, shoes. I feel like if you went to the church, yeah, he was Jewish also. Like everyone, yeah, Jewish like there. everybody. The lumber guy uh, and uh, uh, Brian Ingber, they were all all wow. hidden, and they were very very friendly. And warm, and they really wanted to learn. They didn't have any real Kesher to the summer Jews who came up and you know, bungalow colonies and all. They were a community right. of their own. So I was doing a little bit of Kirov then um, and uh, and learning at the same time. And I'm very makotive to uh, Abraham Wolfson, Zechariah Lebracha, who uh, he, he supported the organization. We, had, we went to him and we said, Abraham, there's all these Jews. And he said he'll fund it. So, wow! Uh, but it was great, great, uh, great environment. So why'd you leave it? Uh, so we had at that point we had about five kids, I think. Yeah, uh, five kids, in uh, in a small uh, nine hundred square foot apartment. It was okay. Um, my family called me in um, like nineteen ninety five to come to Lakewood early 95, maybe end of 94, and they were talking about my getting involved in the yeshiva. And it wasn't really on my bucket list. <laughs> Sit tight, because towards the end of this conversation, there were a few things that Reviron says that blew my mind. But first, I want to tell you more about the Tanam series. Again, that's the sound of diamonds clinking together, if you're listening. Now, these are the Tanoim series books that I'm holding, and and they're incredible. I, I'll read you I'll read you my notes on why they're awesome, and then I will speak from my heart. But first, let me give you the very well-polished reasons why you need to bring the Tanoim series into your life. The Tanoim series is published by Feldheim, and it takes you back to the time of the Mishnah, where you'll meet some of the greatest scholars and teachers in Klal Yisrael, like Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, Rabbi Nachem Ishgamzu, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai, Rabbi Meir Balanes, and more. A total of 13 books are available, and eight more are in production. There are a lot of Tanaim. Great storytelling with a lively comic book format that creates a learning experience that will inform, delight, and inspire, inspiration for the nation, children of all ages, including full Gemara sources in the back of each volume. On any order of five or more Tanam series books, use the code, promo code LL20, that's LL20, at checkout, and you'll take, they'll take 20% off your purchase, plus give you free shipping. So, I don't care what age you are. If you're four years old listening to this podcast, my first question is like, why are you a four-year-old listening to this podcast? But hey, what up? How's it going, four-year-old? If you're four years old, you will love this. If you are 10 years old, you will love this. If you are 60,000 leagues under the sea, you will love this book. It doesn't matter what age you are, because I'll tell you why. Because I'm going to open it up. For those watching on YouTube, it is a comic book like style. So you get to read about the Tanaim and also visually see the, I, I don't know if it's so accurate, but it, like if they actually look like this, but you get the point. They, you get to not just read about the story, you feel like you're in the story, in this comic book-like uh, book, and you have the sources at the end. And I've realized that a lot of times in my life where I 
embrace a story into my life, it's usually when I feel a part of it. And that's the beauty of the Tanam series. It happens to be my brother who does kosher money uh, sold this stock, this pile of books on the this this table because we use it for multiple podcasts. And he's like, that is so cool. I need to get this for my kids. And that's true. And I probably should bring him in to talk about it. But that actually happened because I think when anyone sees these, they get blown away. You know, I think there's so many times in Claudia Saul's history that we were so advanced in when it came to Tyra than the rest of the world, or you know, maybe today in commerce or whatever it is. But there are certain parts of the life that I think we were lacking in certain ways. And maybe that was times in you know, art and in just in publication. Today's day and age, we have some of the best books in the world and it's done so well. So please go ahead, buy one of the books from the Tanaim series. It will last with you for the rest of your life. So if it's your kids, it's gonna make an impact on them. And if it's you, you will understand who Hill Hazakin was on such a deeper level. So go ahead, use code LL20 for 20% off and free shipping and the co the the link is in the show notes. Now back to this week's episode. Were you like in a way running away from Liquid in any point, or was it like no? I just I'm doing my own thing, and I'm happy to be upstate New York. Um, I love I've always loved Liquid. I never would have ran away from it. Mm. Just uh, you know, we got married, we moved to Eretz Yisrael. What what which young couple wouldn't want to live in Eretz Yisrael if right. they could? It's, right. Uh, so we ran to Eretz Yisrael, and years in Eretz Yisrael were beyond, beyond anything. And then South Fallsburg was like a little piece of a uh, little piece of Gan Eden hmm. outside of. Uh, if there's Gan Eden outside of Eretz Yisrael, that was it. Um, beautiful, beautiful place. But Lakewood is also a, a really beautiful place. Lakewood was probably more of a, at that point, wasn't a city yet, but. Um, it definitely had a lot more action going on, but we were, thank God, we were content. So I wasn't really looking for anything. Mm. Um, you know, if you have a, if a Jew has bread on their table and uh, you're able to work with with Hashem's children a little bit, work with the Jews and and learn and uh, and nebuchadnezzar from your kids. I mean, that's 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 a lot. Yeah, I'm just so curious. So what got you out of there if you're like well, so content? I, you know, I think Lakewood. Lakewood was the right the right thing to do. Lakewood certainly was struggling at the time. It was growing rapidly, and it was struggling. And uh, I had the opportunity to work with my family on strengthening it, and to work with many great Balabatim. So uh, you can't really say no to that. I mean, if, so if your family calls you, right? And says, "Listen, come in. You know, we've we've got this incredible yeshiva." And this incredible town, and it's growing rapidly. And uh, come, we need your help. You can't say no. I mean, no normal human being would say no to that. <laughs> so, so for you, like, what did you anticipate? Like, did, were they clear on what they wanted you to do, or they said, "We just need help, and we think you're, for whatever reason, the right person to help us." Um, or they didn't even know exactly. They're just like, we, we just don't know where we want to get to in 10 years. We need help with the vision. I, I don't think they were thinking of 10 years. I think they were thinking of like Friday payroll. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. Uh, or, was very or, uh, or, you know, or of the basics. Now, at the time, uh, the world was not as friendly to Tyre as it is today. So not enough people believed in learning and people would criticize Kylo, not understanding it, not understanding what it means to be a Jew, not understanding Tyra. And they would be, uh, they'd be critical of it, and then that was um, it was reality. It was sad, but it was a reality. So uh, a little boosterism is uh, was good. What, what would you say to the? And we're going to get back to that part of your journey. But what would you say? I do, unfortunately, still hear it. I think I hear it less. But what do you say to the people that are like? Why, why are we wasting money on giving people, you know, money to learn Torah and Kolel? They yeah, should I, get a job. And yeah, I used to have a joke about that. Okay, my, my joke was that there are more Jews studying postmodern art than there are Jews studying in yeshiva. Now today it might, might have changed right, a little I, bit. I think I yeah, right. but uh, there are probably still more Jewish lawyers named Goldberg. Right, than <laughs> more people studying in yeshiva. Torah belongs to the Jewish people, and. Um, 
we're serious when we say that. We all we all know it's true, and we all know, it, as Chazal described it, our nice is nice of. It's our fealty to Tyre that carries us. That's what distinguishes us. What makes us great is not our Nobel Prize winners, not Israeli technology. Uh, it's not all the mathematicians or the scientists or the philosophers. It's our connection to Tyre that distinguishes us. And when we lose it, we lose our distinctiveness and we lose our connection to Yiddishkeit. So how dear people even think to criticize that? What does that say about the person who's criticizing it? Um, is it a cheap shot? Sometimes. Is it guilt? Sometimes. Some of it is a lack of understanding. But at the end of the day, you know, today there's a war in Ukraine. The Ukrainian guy doesn't nitpick how Ukraine is fighting the war. He says, my people are in a mortal battle for survival, and they're going to make a lot of mistakes, but I'm with them in that battle. And we Jewish people have always been, but especially now, are in a mortal battle for the survival of the Jewish people. And our survival depends entirely on our connection to Hashem, which is expressed with Torah, Tefillah, and Chesed. So these people are committed to it. We should laud them. We should be creating thrones and carrying the B'nai Torah through the streets that they're willing to sacrifice for it. And we should be proud, and we should feel bad if we're not giving them enough support and all. I think people kind of know that. Or if they don't know it, then it's worth certainly worth a good think. Sit down on your couch, have a cigar or a drink, a little bourbon, and think to yourself, what does it mean to be a Jew? What makes me unique? How, how important is it? Now, tragically, for some people, it's really not important. But if it is important to you, then what does it mean to be a Jew? And what it really means is you are the Am HaNifra, you're the nation of Hashem. And what connects us to Hashem are Taira, Tefillah, and Chesed. And if you take out Taira, you certainly don't have the other two. That's really beautiful. So uh, what, what was like the first or biggest thing that you wanted to tackle to help I guess BMG get the paycheck on Friday. Like what? I don't know. I I'd be just so scared to like walk into it. And like, I guess obviously there's just a lot of movement and a lot of chaos, not necessarily in a negative way. Just, there's just so much happening. How do you just like freeze it down and say, okay, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. So there is some benefit to young and dumb. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> never forget that. Um, and you know, sometimes it's the young and dumb who are, they're stupid enough not to be afraid. Um, certainly, if I would have had a keen understanding of all the challenges, I might have said, hey, I don't measure up to this, and I, I can't do it. And it, it's a chesed. It's, it's like becoming a parent, you know. If you if you really know what's entailed, you'd say, it's just too much for me. Like, I can't do this. Um, but you have the blessing of, you jump in. Um, you know, my thinking at the time was uh, I couldn't understand why more people didn't believe in it. And that was the puzzle. And I figured, hey, if we could crack that puzzle, if people believe in it, it will work. When you say the people, which people? People yeah, that could everybody. help fund yeshiva? Or everybody. Just oh, you know, people, people give to what's socially acceptable, what's socially popular. Mm. So you know, wealthy people or people of means or people who have excess money often follow what the people are thinking. Mm. So if a climate is friendly to something, then it will garner support. If it's unfriendly, it won't garner support. And if there's an impression that I have is that there was insufficient love and feeling of connection to lame day tire to those who are learning into the tire mission so ultimately the i guess the biggest piece of the puzzle was like sort of creating some form of pr campaign to convey how important and cool and 
essential Torah learning is. Yeah, I don't like the term PR. Okay. Because PR yeah. implies almost like some Madison Avenue exec with a big cigar <laughs> and a shiny suit trying, no, to man- not trying to manipulate somebody. No, it's not like PR is, is yeah. authentic. It's This is what... Yeah, I, I, I right, wouldn't okay. call it PR. I, I'd kind of say that it's it's much more of a, a recentering on basics. Mm. And you, know, you grew up in a certain way and you grew up with certain basics and... I would say Claudius Rawl has certain basics. And in a sense, it grew up with those basics. And like a child, those were the assumptions. Those were natural. Those were normal. And then it didn't feel that. And then it wasn't connected to it. And we could go into the Enlightenment. We could talk about all the things that happened throughout history that led to where, where it was. But certainly in the 1980s, 70s, 80s, in America, it wasn't the most friendly place to Lima Tyra. Contrast that with today, where right now there are maybe 50 Balabatim here from Argentina learning for a week. In a, another week or so, uh, about 100 Balabatim will come here from Mexico to learn. Wow. And they go back. These are Balabatim. They're mostly from the uh, uh, Halab Syrian community. Some are from the Shami Syrian community a handful of Ashkenaz guys, they learn every day. They learn for hours a day. And they're balabatim, they're successful and all. And that's really the way life should be. When you meet people like that, they don't have any issues with <laughs> with with, uh, with Lima to Tyra and, and with the connection to Tyra. Why is that? Because they're just away from like the, I guess, Because mis- they're, they're living it. If, right. you're, if you're learning and you understand it and you're living it, so why would you have any issues with it? Right, I hear that. So you were, you could tell me if I'm incorrect here, you were the CEO of BMG for 27 years. Is there one particular, I guess, person, time, or story where they, I don't know, you approach them and they're like, nah, whatever, and, and you're like, no, no, I'm going to get this person to like see how amazing Torah learning really is? I think that... It, you, one of the best things I would do is I just invite people to come see the yeshiva and they had never seen it and they'd come in and they'd be absolutely blown away. As a matter of fact, uh, I took a gentleman on a tour of the yeshiva today and uh, he's uh, from Long Island. He would consider himself to be uh, maybe, I don't know if his perceptions are right, but he would he might say to you that he's more modern, mm-hmm. from more modern background. I don't know that he is, but uh, he walked into Yeshiva and like a moment of shock, and then his eyes lit up. And uh, like it was such a moment for him that I'd like say to him, yeah, you could take out your camera and take a picture. <laughs> you know, like People, they get inspired. They want to grab a picture. They're not living in the moment because they're so determined – to preserve that moment for posterity. Hmm. And he was like, no, this is really something that is remarkable. What is what is what is he saying that's so he's saying a base measures full of the future of young from B'nai Taira learning, engaged in learning with the passion Ava Satira. And you see Ava Satira on people, that's that's powerful. That is very powerful. We'll be right back to this week's episode, but I want to tell you about this gym. Okay, so I started doing podcasts two and a half years ago, and my constant conversation to people about why they should listen to my podcast wasn't why they should really listen to my podcast. It was just explaining to them how the opportunity, it's it's just so easy, but like, is it a sheer? I don't know if it's a sheer. I don't know if it's, if it's, uh, it's a conversation. You're getting insights into the most incredible people, how they navigate life, the challenges they've gone through, and the advice that they have. And the product, I think, sells itself. Now, there's another place that I think the firm world could use a lot more innovation, and that comes to how you purchase your SRIG and Arbaminum, and a lot of things, but I'm gonna focus on Esrig Shopper. I am thrilled to partner with them to tell you about them because Esrig Shopper is a way to easily buy and purchase an Esrig, your Arbaminum, whatever it is, through their website. They give you that personal feel. The thing that they guarantee is customer service. When you wanna buy an Esrig, you want the best. 
or you want the cheapest, whatever it is that you want, what that you need, they will give that to you. And they're so good that they give you 100% money back guarantee if you're not satisfied or to swap it with something that you prefer. But they landed on the mark. I've had so many friends tell me to use them and I had a great great experience with them. So I was very, it's always best when someone, when someone wants to do an ad with you that you actually really use and enjoy. So EssexShopper.com. But there's even more. If you are a Inspiration for the Nation fan or Living L'Chaim fan, you're going to get 5% off your purchase with the code LL5. Those are the letters LL5 for 5% off and who doesn't appreciate 5% off? Also, it's tracked so they could see how many people are actually watching this ad and buying with them. So please, if you're a fan of this show, please go ahead and try them out. Give them a call. I guarantee that you'll give them a call and link in the show notes, and you'll be so happy with them. And they they don't discriminate. So if you want to buy an inexpensive asterisk, if you want to buy a gorgeous million-dollar asterisk, I don't know if that million-dollar asterisk is, but... Whatever it is, whatever you're looking for, a certain size, shape, smell, taste, they've got it. They're the people. They're the place that I want you to play this ad in five years, in 10 years. And you'll be thinking, like, how did I navigate Yuntif without Estric Shopper? It makes Yuntif smooth, but also it, it, it really adds to the mitzvah. They walk because you're not physically there and you're doing it online doesn't mean that you don't care about the mitzvah. They're there. They, they, they sit with you virtually and talk to you and get to understand what you need and why you need it. And if you don't believe me, go to EssexShopper.com. Look at the reviews. They're incredible. And people love them. Use code LL5 for 5% off. Please use them. Now back to this week's episode. So I had your Mechutin on the show, uh, Maish Bain, and I was talking to him about a lot of things. And, and one of the questions I asked him, I, I want to ask you as well. Um, you seem to have a very macro and micro, but for now, macro view, I guess, of maybe the world or just Yiddish guy at large, what would you say is one of the biggest challenges that the from community has right now? And, and, and once identifying it, what could we do to really help resolve it? It takes extra, or, yeah, I've thought about this once or twice. Maybe my Mechutin and I have even had a few, yeah. years, a few conversations about it. Um, Sometimes when you see an individual or a group with real passion for Hashem and for Yiddishkeit, you say, wow, but that really should be the norm everywhere. And you know, Chazal do tell us um, people become used to what they have. We, we, we as human beings normalize our situation and we begin to accept that that's the norm, that's the regular and that's just the way life is. And you know, there's an expression, born to the manor. So when you're born to the manor, you might not know that you're living in the manor. Manor, M-A-N-O-R. Mm -hmm. So um, if you go to Eish Kodesh in, 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 uh, in Woodmere and you see Rabbi Weinberger's shul and you see Yidden dancing, you feel a sense of passion. We should be like that every day. Hmm. And we have a lot of commitment. We have tremendous commitment. We even have a lot of sacrifice. Um, there's not always enough passion. Hmm. So if you look at the uh, at three legs of uh, anxiety, commitment, and passion, there's probably commitment is the highest. Uh, anxiety is second. Uh, anxiety about from fitting in, making it work. Your kids should have the right. Hair. That's not number one. I don't think so. Okay, I mean, good. Yeah. That commitment's number yeah, one. Yeah, I think commitment is number one. And That's then, positive. And then uh, anxiety uh, is uh, is is above passion. And then if you think of it, the end goal of life really is the commitment. You want to be committed to something. And then there's two ways you can be committed to something. All human beings operate out of some mix of fear and opportunity. Saying, oh, fear of law. Yeah, yeah. Avan Yura, fear of loss, desire of gain. And it's it's part, it's all hardwired into the human psyche. And then um, 
you know, fear of losses. Uh, my kids won't get into the right yeshiva, the right school. I won't get the right shidduch. I'm not going to have parnasa. I can't do this. I can't do that. It's not working. The problems and God blesses us, us with challenges. Um, so we've got our well-deserved share of anxiety. <laughs> and we have a blessing of tremendous commitment. Um, but maybe we're a little weak on the passion side. And if we had more passion, uh, passion obviously has to be directed, but if we had more passion, we'd have a lot more joy and people wouldn't be so unhappy or upset. You know, one of the things that always is always telling to me, and I, I thought I should really do a book on it, is just take all the online comments. Imagine if you were to want to get a snapshot of society. You, have you heard of the Cairo Geniza? No. Yeah, so the Cairo Geniza was in Fustat, was old Cairo, was this incredible repository of Seamus. And, but it wasn't just Sfarim. The Geniza had community documents, divorce documents, letters of commerce. It had uh, bills. It had data. And it was a, a great Geniza, the Cairo Geniza. And studying it, Get, gives a real sense of what life was like in the year 1000 in Cairo. And it's, it's a remark, remarkable journey into that. So if you wanted to do that journey today, so imagine if you took all the online comments from, let's scrape three sites, let's scrape Vos's Nayas, <laughs> Yeshiva World, and Matzev, oh, gosh. and take the Lakewood Scoop and a few others, and just put all the comments into a book. And then take that book, go out on the beach, take a corn corn cob pipe, smoke the pipe in 200 years from now and read it. What would strike you from that snapshot of society? I don't, I would cry maybe. You'd cry. I think so. I don't yeah, know. I, you'd cry. I don't think it would be very positive. You'd cry, yeah. And why would you cry? I do would imagine I'm not, I don't know I don't like scour the, the those sites but I, I imagine there's a lot of negative comments there yeah. and like complaints so, and so when people are responding that way uh, maybe sometimes knee jerk maybe not but it tells you that they're they're suffering mm. and it tells you that they're feeling pain um, you know if uh, if something happens and you react in a negative way you're in pain usually. And there's a lot of pain out there. And then you read a story, and then it could be a story about kosher Chinese Express and Manalp in New Jersey. It could be a story about Israel, a story about some Rebbe or whatever, whatever it is. And again, if you scraped a million comments and you put them in a book and some future scientist studies it, they'd say, wow, those people are a lot of people in pain, a lot of hurting people. A lot of people lashing out um, and not a lot of thoughtfulness. Now, of course, you have to normalize it because it's kind of reactive and it feeds on itself. Also, those sites, not like putting them down, but a lot of those sites get clicks and views on a lot of type of news that... Right, but even innocent, if you, would, if you were to... Right. And you could trust me on this one. <laughs> even if you were to take innocent stories, <clears throat> they often devolve... And it's like that in secular right, society right, right, right. into the lowest common denominator of attack and, and people saying really stupid things and the next guy saying a stupid thing and, and then people uh, a acting in, uh, in, in ways that show that they're disrespectful, mm. really just disrespectful of others. And uh, it would not be a very flattering portrait, right. to say the least. And again, you could say that it's only a segment of the population, and and uh, it's online, and it's it's it's. it's the real Yidden aren't using the internet. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah. So, so uh, to me, if there was a lot more passion for Yiddishkeit, there'd be a lot more simcha in Yiddishkeit. If there was a lot more simcha, there'd be a lot more satisfaction, and then the challenges that we all face would be worthwhile challenges because of the simcha that you experience. So if you experience great joy, you don't mind the struggle for the joy because the struggle is how you get to the joy. Mm. And uh, if you're a marathon runner, you're going to suffer pain. 
you're not gonna you're not gonna get to the end of the marathon without pain. And if you're running a race and you want to win the race, you're gonna suffer pain. And it's worthwhile. Certainly if you're an Olympic athlete, you will wreck your body probably for your entire life. If you're a baseball pitcher, you will end up with arthritis. If you're a a, a professional skier, you're not going to have knees. You won't be able to walk up and down the steps by the time you're done. Um, but people do that because the joy is worth the pain and the struggle and the suffering. If they're bitter about it, then it's really, in their minds, it's not really so worth it. So I'd love to see, you know, not that I'm anyone to love to see it, but in response to your question, just a lot more passion, simcha, and joy, and a lot less of getting caught up in 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 in, uh, in in just in the pain or the anger or the upset or 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 the it's not right quote unquote hmm. whatever it is that they're looking at. We'll be right back this week's episode, and I am here again with my good friend, Rav David M. Cohn, and we're here today to talk about his book, Together Again, and the contents of the book. But first, if you don't know who he is, get your head out of a rock, out of a rock, from under a rock, I don't know phrase as well, but he's the man, he's awesome. You probably have heard him speak, whether you know on a Pesach program or Sukkot program, scholar in residence, I mean, I, we had to get this ad in before you're going to Alaska. Bez Hashem, this Sunday. That's yeah. amazing. I guess by the time you produce this, I'll be back. Right? Yeah, but okay, well. I, hope, I hope you had a good trip there, being a scholar in residence there. Um, but really, truly incredible, you're a man of many hats, um, whether you're in dealing with therapy, which we're actually gonna get into over here, um, um, being a rabbi, um, just being a, a leader in the community, and just being an incredible, incredible speaker. Um, but so, what's your relationship with relationships? So, I read a lot about this in my first book, actually. My first book, which was amazing. We're almost there, right? Uh, you know, dealing with life's challenges. I got married when I was 31 years old. So I had a lot of time in Shiduchim, and I had a lot of time to really reflect and think about what type of marriage I, I want to have when I when I merit to, to finally get married. I've been married now, thankfully, 18 years and, and counting. Very It'd be funny if you're like, I'm married now for like four years. <laughs> so you're like getting all this stuff. Anything goes nowadays. Right. But I'm only, I've only I'm married for 18 years, which is yeah. a decent amount no, of time. Decent matter. amount of time. But but I did a tremendous amount of, of reading and, and preparation. And just because of my life circumstance, I, I worked at times with a lot of students in Stern College for Women, Lander College for, for, for Women. I worked at Yeshiva University counseling a lot of students many years ago, but that had a lot of, I worked on the Upper West Side as a Rav and I worked with a lot of singles. So I always was very focused on this aspect, the particular aspect within relationships. We of course talk about all different types of relationships in the book, but I have a very strong place in my heart for, for marriage mm. as kind of the shoresh, as, as the root of, of everything. There's a concept you know, that the, the bedroom is like the Kodesh Kadashim, right? We don't talk about what goes on in people's bedrooms. It's very intimate. It's very private. Sure. But in a broader sense, marriage is really the, it's like the sine qua non. It's like the pin pinnacle. It's like the apex. It's it's the core relationship that you can really have in, in life. It's so it's so powerful. And it's right, two people coming together, creating one, and it's not a time for all the different Shavu Torah. <laughs> but, but the idea being that that it's something that I, that I really think Shalom Bias is, is the key to everything. You know, business success, Shalom Bias. You want, you, you, just everything is really rooted in that dynamic and that relationship. And I, of course, in my exploration of relationships, I spend a lot of time also talking about like the nuts and bolts in 2022 and beyond of a healthy relationship and a healthy dynamic. There's so much at play. There's so many distractions, social media and the role that it plays, podcasts and the role that they play sure, sure. and how our attention is, is is in so many different directions and how we have to really be able to hone in our partner. Listening is something that's so critical. Our Kodesh Baruch gave us two ears and one mouth. We're supposed to listen at least twice mm -hmm. as much as we right. speak. Chazal teach us this idea. It's brought in secular therapeutic models as well. And I just talk a lot about this quality of, of being able to really listen, to, to, to be empathic, to hear, and to connect, and to do it with the person that's so essential in either direction. And it's something I invest a lot of my time in, in terms of helping people, guiding them, coaching them, and helping them reach the best possible levels of shalom bias they possibly can have. Which is incredible. And, and for anyone who wants to work on the relationships and you know it's not the end goal but the, the, definitely reading together again 
together again, reimagining the relationships that anchor our lives. See, I got the full title in there. Yeah. Um, is definitely a great, great way to start working on it and just an easy way to just consume it. And it's it's amazing. I'm, I'm mill going through it. It's really incredible. And um, what particularly also what I really, I was like skim it. I always skim a book. I saw at the end, like something that's not really done in books. Could you just tell us quickly what you did over there? Yeah, so many years ago, I used to, on occasion, I used to write pretty regularly for Mishpacha magazine back in the day in terms of their guest line. Yes, I remember. Columns. Yeah. But there was also in the in the second section, I think the women's section, so I often would respond to different questions. That part that I people don't remember, would, would but write, I didn't read people would write in, I'd write a response. Right. So we thought it would be interesting. My editors and myself and Mosaic Press, of course, deserves a shout out yeah. for the great work that They're they incredible. do with many authors and the work they've done with me. They really did a perfect job on this book. In terms of we actually created a section at the very end of the book to culminate all the concepts, mm. to put it like La Misa, very practical. We actually that. present specific questions that I've dealt with in my professional career, counseling and coaching people, and we actually address them. And a lot of them have to do with the topic of marriage in terms of in-law issues. You know, How do I deal with my in-laws? How do I deal with Shona Rishona? How do I deal with the early stages of marriage? And we do a lot of exploration. How do we do with finances, right? You guys have a podcast, right? Yeah, Kosher money. money, which sure. is a, you know, so this is a big topic for people today, finances, and how do we manage our finances, and how do, what the role finances play in marriage. So we talk a lot about that as well and the different dynamics. What happens when the a lot of young people are very successful, like when the when the when the kids have more money than the parents right, or, yeah. or, or vice versa. So these are all issues that we talk about. It's kind of a question answer type of format. It's like an ask Rabbi Cohen section at the very end of the book. So it's kind of a nice way to kind of take all the concepts and constructs that we've developed. And, and what I like about this book in contrast to my previous book, it's about a hundred pages shorter than my previous book because it's written for the the, for the short attention span that many of us have, right. including myself. So I really want to kind of get right at it. You know, it's That's 150 amazing. pages. It's like talkless. On that like, note, I feel like crazy. people are going to be like, oh my gosh, how long? I, 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 I'm i giving more time for these ads because I think the actual conversation is really interesting. So anyone who wants to work on any of the relationships, go ahead and pick up together again in your local farm stores, on Amazon, on RabbiDovidMCone.com. And now back to this week's episode. Awesome. Uh, what you're saying makes me so excited because the name of my network is called Living L'chaim. Like yeah. the whole goal is like, like I'm creating different shows to help people navigate life. I mean, I it's all I'm doing it all for me. I just Baruch Hashem had a great upbringing. It was amazing, but at a certain point, I just I, and I had everything and I have everything, and I'm just like, why am I not more happy? I should be. I, everything's great, and I was just myself personally just bogged down with so many rules and this and that. And just creating, I'm trying to create content that helps people just That's beautiful. Just enjoy and have l'chaim, you know, um, which I think is a great segue for me to like introduce to everyone that you left being CEO of BMJ to be CEO of Living L'chaim, which I'm very excited about. And um, yeah, we're, we're very excited. Do you have any comment on that? Uh, well, I think you're doing a great job. <laughs> you really don't I'll need my help. I'll hand it over. Yeah, you really don't need my help. You're really doing a great job. And uh, um if you could bring sparks of positivity and and some kind of people, that but more, I, it's not even like I want like Baruch Hashem practical. Like we just kosher money did a whole episode on like Meiser and like with uh, Rabbi Kushner. Like I just want to make it practical. Like just yeah. go through it and like really delve into it. You mentioned skiing. I I think I know that you're into skiing yourself. Well, I I enjoy mountains and I I've always loved the mountains. My father loved the mountains. Rav Hirsch famously went to visit the Alps right before he died. I don't know if you know the story. I think the famous story of like, yeah. Hashem creating this beautiful yeah, Hashem, world. Right. He said to his tell me, I'm going to come upstairs soon. And Hashem's going to say, Hirsch, did you see my Alps? Hmm. Or Shamshan, did you see my Alps? Uh, so I love the mountains. Uh, we loved living in South Fallsburg. I love the woods. I love the trees. And uh, I, I do like to keep fit. And uh, so... Skiing uh, Shabbos Hanukkah with my grandchildren is a, it's a great joy. Is it like, I guess, amazing is the word I'm thinking of, for you to see, like just growing up in Lakewood, and we touched on this in the beginning, with one or two kids in your class that were Shomer Shabbos, and now just, I'm from Flatbush. I feel like, like Flatbush was the place when I was growing up, like now Lakewood is the place in a certain sense, and, and just everything, like if, is that like incredible for you to see that like growth? One of the very inspiring people in uh, in the Cutler family life was uh, Miss Mrs. Esther Hertzka, Ernest Hertzka's uh, wife, Ralph's uh, mother, 
And um, in her later years, she moved to Lakewood and she moved, she lived at Ninth and Madison and she would stand at her window watching the Cheder buses pull up with the children getting off the buses and she'd just have, you know, these tears of joy or feelings of joy um, and her. So this some people might not agree with and they're uh, welcome to disagree. That's okay. Uh, but when I go through Lakewood and I see traffic and hmm. all that, it's like joy. It's nachas for you. Yeah, it's like these are, these are, this is a Jewish, and they don't even have to be yidden. Right. It's a Jewish community, and this is a vibrant, thriving, flourishing, and, uh, you know, Vilna was one-third Jewish before the Holocaust. Three percent of Lithuanian Jews survived. Kovna was uh, probably about half Jewish in Lithuania, and we can go through Warsaw and Budapest and um, the Shtetlach around the world, uh, cities like Salonika. I mean, Europe Europe was packed, Baruch Hashem, at the time with Jews, and that was all wiped out. And they were, it was gone in a, literally in a, in, in a moment, and plus a lot of losses to communism and atheism and assimilation and all. So to see Jews together, and you walk into a store and you see a from Yid and, and the from Yid's behind the counter serving pizza to the from Yid and they have a smile, and there's a stucco box over there and you can get kosher pizza and uh, you can get 90 different flavors of kosher pizza, <laughs> more flavors than Baskin Robbins. <laughs> How could you not just have joy? So, so there's no parking spot in the parking lot. Thank God there's no parking <laughs> spot in the parking lot. You know how many cities there are that I travel to that can't even afford to support. They don't have enough Jews, I should say, to support a kosher pizza shop. Right. Go to Tucson, Arizona. It's a, I was just there. It's funny that you say that. Tucson is a developing community, and it's a, it has a Mirza Shem is going kind to of have a bright Jewish future. But wow, there's no there's no kosher pizza shop there yet. Right. As far as I yeah. Know. No, there's not. Yeah. We had so, to get food from Phoenix. It was whole balagan. Yeah. So uh, it's not such a balagan. It's, it's good people. No, no, no. Yeah. If you're thinking of moving, you should move there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The uh, but so we're we're these are brachas. So if you if you go to a kosher restaurant and you have to wait in line to be seated, you are from the luckiest Jews in hmm. Jewish history. First of all, you're lucky to be a human being. You're lucky to be alive. You're lucky to be a Jew. You're lucky that you weren't born right before Chelmanitsky's hordes came down. You're lucky you weren't born in some pogrom. You're lucky you weren't born in their demi status. Uh, under under the Moors, or, or uh, in the time of the Rambam and and the the massacres by uh, by uh, early Muslims in Cordoba and the other places in the Iberian Peninsula, you're lucky the Romans weren't dragging you out in chains. Right, you're free. <laughs> you live in the best time in Jewish history that we can remember for sure to live as a Jew, and you have all these amenities and you have all these. Uh, you're a ray of kosher liquors and your food and your yeshivas and you wear your yarmulke in the street and nobody says anything and I, I travel the world and people don't, they're, they're nice to you and they're actually respectful uh, by and large. There's always, the world ha always has a certain percent of idiots. That's a <laughs> part of life. You know, people may say nasty comments, but it's rare the norm is you can live as a from yid. We're the luckiest people. I hear you. Listen, the pogroms were bad, but come on, like a lot of traffic on the way to work isn't the best. No, okay. Um, yeah, that's a very good mindset, and that's very true. Um, okay, so towards the end of the, the interview, I'd like to ask my guests the, a similar list of questions. So we're at that point. Some of them are a little strange, and I usually give them a, people a heads up. I didn't have time to give you a heads up, but roll with me if you can. Um, if there's one person from history or someone who's no longer alive, that you could spend an hour with? Who would you spend that hour with? Rashi. Rashi. Oh, wow. Yeah. It sounds like you had this answer. Yeah. Why Rashi? Uh, because you can't learn Chumash in much of Gemara without Rashi. And then you can't really understand, fully understand Rashi without Ramban. You do need Evan Ezra a little bit. And then Ramban argues on Rashi in a lot of places. And Ramban had the benefit of being after Rashi. So therefore... In a sense, the Ramban has the last word. Hmm. And that, obviously, sometimes if there's a machlekas, so you would lean toward the one with the last word because 
Rashi doesn't have the benefit of having been alive to explain his rebuttal. So if you could sit with Rashi and have that rebuttal, you would have a global understanding of Rashi and Ramban, and of course, Evan Ezra in the mix. What greater joy would there be than that? Okay, that's an incredible answer. Uh, there's 613 mitzvahs, and everyone connects to different mitzvahs in different ways. Is there one particular mitzvah today that you feel a little more connected to? Well, you remind me, my father, Simcha, putting the schach on top of the sukkah was really uh, really incredible. I used to watch him, and he he would be out there, and uh, just... It was it was something to it was something to see just his joy at, at putting up the schach. Uh, is there one mitzvah that I feel particularly uh, connected to? I feel connected to a lot of them, not enough of them, I should say, hmm. but cer- certainly to a lot of them. Um, you you need something over the others. It's 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 a question for you to interpret. Like, yeah, I, I think if there's a time, let me let me answer it not in the way you're asking. Me. Sure. If there's a time of the year that I appreciate most, it's Pesach, um, because that's the formation of us as a people, and that's an opportunity to really think about that and really focus on that. Not that. There's anything less than a Sukkot or, or, right. or Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah and all. But that feeling of Pesach, of you and your family, and engaging in that journey of developing into a nation of Klal Yisrael is, is something that's really, uh, it's probably, it's sublime, I would say, in a sense. What's the worst advice you've ever received? Who? I don't know that I've ever received bad advice. Never? Everyone receives bad I advice. I think that I ever received bad advice. We just block it out sometimes. We could reverse it and say, what's the best advice yeah. you've ever received? You know, sometimes people say you can't do it. Um, and I think if you ever tell a person they can't do something, uh, you should think long and hard because... Uh, it's hard to know all the variables of, uh, you know, of, of when you give advice, it's hard to know all the variables. And when you receive advice, the person giving you advice doesn't really know all the variables either. Um, so uh, I, I can't say I've gotten a lot of bad advice. I wouldn't say that. Sometimes people think things can't be done. That's okay. Um, it's just advice. It's not. It's not. Mm. It's not like they're making the rules. They're right. just giving you advice. But I can't think of any bad advice. Uh, uh, what about the reverse? The best advice. There are a lot of wise people out there. I. I think. The best advice that maybe I could share would be to seek counsel of others and always have that open mind. There are so many people out there, and if you have good mentors and good friends, um, yeah, you know what I think is the best advice, really, mm-hmm. is when you're listening, really listen. Don't make believe you're listening. Don't be waiting to get your turn really listen and we we religious jews sometimes we might have a hard time with that so we want to get the word out we want to get the word out right. and and we're just really waiting to get the word in and we're going to be polite sometimes to let the other guy finish and uh if you're doing that you're not really listening so be an active listener that the best advice i've gotten from people is you are not a good enough listener. Become a better listener. Be an active listener. I love that. Is there a story that either, I guess, happened in your life or maybe a story that you've heard that gives you chizek, that makes you proud, that gives you strength? Ooh, you're a very specific guy. I um, guess so. You see, there's a lot of platitude stories that kind of inspire us. 
that we hear and we we experience and we go through them, but then they just form part of a small part of the psyche. Uh, I think that there are certain exceptional individuals who achieved such outsized results in their lives. And when you think about their life story, and sometimes something they did highlights that, but you think of their life story, that forces you to reappraise what is possible and what's not possible. And I've been blessed to know many of those people. I think of Rabbi Yitzchak Soloveitchik in learning, or Rabbi Nayak Weinberg in Kirov, or Zev Wolfson in Askanas. Um, I've been very blessed to know a lot of people. If I have a bracha, many brachas in my life, but if I have one of my exceptional brachas is to know people who achieved such outsized results compared to what you would have thought is possible, that it kind of encourages you to reappraise what do you think you can do in your life, with your life? That's really beautiful. So, Rebaran Cutler, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. Get ready. There's a few really special episodes coming up. And it's just a great way to get into the zone, get into Yantif, get into whatever time in life that you're listening to this. Don't forget to use the links in the show notes to buy your new Westrig, to buy the incredible Tanaim series, to buy Reb David M. Kuhn's book. It really helps me. It helps this podcast. It's, it gives the fuel for me and us to do more episodes. So please go ahead and use their links to upgrade your life. And if you didn't yet rate our show, please go and rate it five stars on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Leave a comment on YouTube and keep on being inspirational for your national. I hate that catchphrase. L'chaim. Living L'chaim.